welcome to the data science learning community. Our package is uh, cohort six. We're looking at chapter 19 today about building a website for your package. Um, there are just three learning objectives that I put in here today. And really the first two are the main ones that we're gonna learn how to uh, create a package website with package down and then deploy that website with GitHub Actions. Um, really, those are all one thing we will see. <laughs> and then we'll, log, we'll walk through the ways that we can customize our package website beyond that initial setup. Um, <laughs> this one, I once I saw this quote, I was like, oh, okay, I need to take this chapter because I think it's a side, like I think I'm one of the people at least that they were mentioning in here that they said that they hear from folks that uh, they that we put off learning package down because we think it's going to be a lot of work. And then we do it. She says, eventually execute the two commands we show next, but really it's just one command and you have a, a website. Um, and so, you know, I did that. I said that on Twitter a um, year and a half ago or so. Finally learned to use package down and learning to use package down is like running one command. So. Uh, we'll go through and see how that works. But I just wanted to mention that because I thought it was funny when I saw that. All right. And the reason that this package exists is like there's so much text that goes with a package. That's actually one of the really good things about R is we have kind of a, a system and a culture of documenting pretty well, or at least, you know, often <laughs> documenting pretty well. You We have all the help docs for functions. We have data set documentation that we've learned how to do. We can have vignette, uh, vignettes, and they talked in the vignettes chapter about articles, which are basically vignettes that aren't published with the package um, in the package bundle. Um, we have a readme usually, we have news. So we have all this information. Let's turn it into a website. And that's what package down is for. So use this, has this command, use package down. But I, I want to say, like, if you're like typing as you follow along, I mean, you can type that. But you don't need to wait till the next slide before you type anything. Um, so this use package down, it creates this YAML file, package down .yaml. Um, It adds some things to our build ignore so that like that package down .yaml doesn't freak cran out, things like that. Um, it adds a docs folder to git ignore. And that's going to hold like your local version of the uh, website. And the reason it does that is we're going to use GitHub Actions for like the real version of the website. And you don't want to double up on the uh, double copy it basically. And then, um, you know, the next command is package down build site, which will, once you have all that set up, it will render, render it and open it up in your default browser. And but I said, you know, wait, because there's this other command, use package down GitHub pages, which actually will run use package down for you. So really this command does everything. Um, it runs use package down. It creates a separate, a special branch in your GitHub for the um, package down site. Um, it turns on GitHub pages. It points GitHub pages at that branch um, and just, you know, an important thing to know is GitHub Pages is free for public repos. So there's almost no reason not to do this. <laughs> um, it sets up this workflow to just automatically uh, build the, the website every time you push your package to GitHub. Um, and it adds the URLs to places that package down cares about and to the root of your repo. So it does all the things. And that was what I was tweeting about of, Holy crap, there's like literally nothing to learn. It just, I mean, that one command is what you need to learn to have the website and then it does everything for you. So that's pretty cool. All right. So, and at that point, if you want, you're done. Like you have a website, it'll have all your documentation. It'll have your vignettes. Um, it, it puts your readme there at the front of it. it it's really nice. Um, but there are lots of other options and actually, those other options are why I wanted to present this chapter because I only knew some of them. Um, uh, and, and this chapter, a lot of this chapter is just like pointing to package down help for more details. 
Um, and so here she pointed out to go to the um, the main vignette of Package Down uh, to see some help. Or if you go to the Package Down website, uh, it is the getting started vignette because that is a thing that you can automatically create with Package Down. All right, so the, <laughs> the first thing she talks about is uh, hex logos. Um, if you haven't been to an R conference, you might not know that hex logos are like a really big thing <laughs> in the R community. Uh, there have been a couple of attempts to kind of figure out why. And uh, it, mostly it seems to be like it started in JavaScript, I think. Um, but I think it was just that Hadley made one and people thought it was cool. And then like everyone started making them for their packages. And a big thing at conferences is like hunting the stickers, making sure you get all the package down stickers or the, sorry, hex stickers for various packages. Um, so this hex, hexba.in, hexbin slash sticker.html gives you like the standard template if you want to print um, hex stickers. And it has some links to a bunch of websites where you can get them printed. Um, there's also a hex sticker package for making hex stickers. Uh, I can't remember if I've ever tried this, um, so I might need to play with that. I use a program called Inkscape. It's an open source SVG editor. And then um, if you just search for uh, RStudio or Posit hex stickers, they have all of their logos um, in a GitHub repository. And usually, uh, or at least at one point, I started from a sticker of theirs that I liked the general layout and then edited in Inkscape. Um, once you figure out a logo, you can use use this, use logo to, you just point to where you currently have the file and you'll copy it to the right place in your package. Um, and by doing that, it will now be part of your package down site. All right. I've got like 30 hex stickers <laughs> from the last shiny conference. I need to figure out what yeah. to do with. I've got like various ones. Uh, so this is a package that we made at my old job for Bert in R. So that's my fancy R Bert sticker. And uh, Sure, I've got other ones around here. Oh, we made one just for internally that we were Macmillan. And so we had our Macmillan R <laughs> X sticker. Uh, anyway, so yes, they're they're all over the place. Uh, let's see, anything cool in here? We got Sloop, that's a pretty one. Anyway, all over the place. I have stickers all around me, not to mention the 30 or so that I have on my laptop. Um. They're fun. It is definitely a step I do. Like when I have an idea for a package while I'm kind of just letting it simmer a little bit, I'll pull up Inkscape and play around with the logo. And if that, if the logo's good enough when I first make it, it's like, oh, well, got to make that package. So uh, it is really funny that it's a thing, but it's a thing. Um, yes. So you can buy like sleeves for laptops and that can get you through the commitment problem because then you can like swap out the sleeve. But I think my laptop is getting to be on its last legs. So I'm going to have to get all new stickers at some point. Um, I never did put hex stickers on my work laptop at my, my last place that just, I couldn't do that. Uh, so there's, to some degree, the laptop that I own, I own because I needed a place to put stickers. Um, <laughs> there, so yes, there you can get uh, magnets printed, and then you can also put it onto magnets. Uh, anyway, a whole separate thing. Um, all right. So the next the next thing that we're going to edit is there's this uh, functions reference. Um, it's in like a it's slash reference, and it's uh, a link at the top of your package down site that says reference. And that is all of the functions, like everything that has a help page. So functions and data sets, and actually you can have help pages that are just kind of 
floating in your documentation. Anything that's there, it'll put in, into this directory as long as it's uh, it's not tagged as internal. Um, and you can use, um, as they've told us, told us before, you can use square brackets, the name of a function and parentheses, and that'll automatically make a link within that doc to a different doc. And a, uh, a neat thing is you can say some other package, colon, colon, function, and it'll link to the package down site for that function um, if that package is set up properly. They, they give steps in here of what you have to do to make this work, but it's basically just use the use this commands and it'll set everything up for you. Um, but yeah, I like that, you know, the, the cross-linking is really nice because you can kind of follow a trail if you're trying to understand something. Um, by default, that, that list is just uh, alphabetical, um, but you can curate it. I, I'm gonna show part of this dplyr file on the next page, but first, um, you know, we can see that they have like these sections for the pieces of uh, the help and even within data frame verbs, they have subsections. I think we're gonna be looking here. Um, it is, it can be tricky, but you know, you can control F to find, because the thing that sometimes I don't like about this is you, it can make it hard to find something but you can search and find it. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, and just having the grouping is so nice. And you can put in little like short descriptions of what things are. Uh, these were really helpful when we did, um, like we did the book club that read the use this docs and the test that docs and things like that. And having these sections was super helpful to figure out kind of what to put into a week. Um, so, beyond just the normal use cases. It was really nice for that. Um, so to do that, within that package down YAML, you can put a section reference and then um, the indentation isn't really clear here. I should have made that a little, made sure that was a little clearer because indentation does matter. So make sure you look at the examples for that. Um, but you just put like a, a uh, uh, dash and then title and colon and the title of your section. So that's that data frame verb section. Um, and then you can have a subtitle rows. So that's this. And then there's a description and this greater than is saying that I want to let my description flow onto a new row. So they do that just for readability here. So that's this verbs that principally, principally operate on rows. Um, and then you have contents, and then each member of the contents is dash, and then either the name of a function. Um, we don't see it here, but you can also do some like starts with if you have a whole set of um, functions that start with the same little piece of a thing. Um, or you can do like I just was kind of <laughs> as part of reading this chapter, I went through and did uh, some things where I have them arranged in families through Roxygen, or you can put an at family tag. And then in here you can do, uh, I can't remember what the command is instead of starts with, but it's like um, has, uh, not has something, let me pull this up. Um, it, it's, you can say it has label or something like that. And I'll, I'll get it into the chat in a minute. Um, and it'll grab all the things that are in that family. So uh, that's really nice that, um, you know, to make this easier to arrange. Um, it can So a caveat about doing this is once you do this, you have to do this. If anything is documented, but doesn't show up in your uh, reference list, it will error out and fail to build the documents. Um, I tried to set up like a catch-all with that you know, with those those commands, but um, something you can do like intentionally, you can put things into more than one category. So if I set a cat a catch all 
it gets everything. <laughs> and so like, it's not like it, it's just the leftovers. It's every function. And I don't really want to do that because I want to know that something is missing. So that's where it comes back to actually uh, the, where are you? The run this on your local copy from time to time to make sure, and it'll tell you what's not in there. Um, and I will come back to that because you said to come back to that. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. You just reminded me when you talked about the indentation thing. <laughs> All right, no problem. Oh, uh, I have a typo here, so I'll have to fix that. Um, so the next thing, the next area is there will, in addition to reference, so I guess you can tab over here. And so there's reference. Um, I'll talk about get started in a second, but there's this articles drop down. And Joe, you know, we're getting a preview that these are clearly not just some automatic uh, arrangement, but they do some some fanciness to set that up. Uh, but by default, all your vignettes go into this articles dropdown. Uh, they talk a little bit about how they went with articles instead of vignettes, because vignette sounds a little bit more like it's some technical term, and they want it to be uh, more general than that. Um, something that I need to look at, I think I have some cases where I should be doing this, that you can reference another vignette always from any vignette. You can just reference it by using this code um, or this this format. And uh, when package down sees that, it will put a link to the vignette um, to the sorry to the article that goes with that vignette. Um, I haven't I haven't done that, but I want to play with that because that's uh, I definitely have a case where like I have one main vignette. Um, again, I'll talk about in a second. And it will say, and then, you know, in this other vignette, I'll, we'll talk about, you know, authentication or something more complicated than is covered in the first vignette. So uh, that's kind of nice. Um, you can reference functions by putting the, the backticks and parentheses and just almost the same as in uh, documentation, except instead of square brackets, you use the single ticks. Um, yeah. That's the, the baseline about vignettes. Um, <laughs> they are also al alphabetical by default, and they didn't really go into how to customize, but you can also uh, go into this build articles article, which I didn't have a chance to go into uh, and learn about it. And if I, had, I guess uh, Bookdown does not have it set up to, for me to do these <laughs> automatic links. I should have obviously set this up as the link to the package down. I don't know what I was thinking. I will have to go through and fix that in the notes that this should be a link to the package down website of the build articles article. Um, but you can, you know, you can go through and customize that, that order to do things like what they have here where they have sections, they have a section on automation, and then they have a link to more articles, which I've seen on quite a lot of these. And it just goes into way more depth about what are these articles, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the, the piece that I don't think, um, yeah, I'm not gonna go into here, which it kind of should, is you can make a vignette that is the name of the package. So if you say, use this, use vignette dplyr, that will create this get started article. So it, um, it's a vignette in your normal package with the name with the file name dplyr, but uh, package down sees that as the main vignette, and so it puts it up as get started. Um, that is like it's mentioned in the book, but it's it's a little hidden, and it's really useful to know. So definitely recommend doing that. Um, just as kind of like a, a way to arrange your help. The other thing you can do, and they, they talked about this back in the vignette chapter, is um, as part of creating package down, um, I think actually part of the reason they created package down is they had some vignettes like for um, Google Drive that were hard to make any sort of documentation that would work on CRAN. Everything needs authentication and everything's just a pain. And so they made vignettes that aren't bundled in the package, but they're on the website. 
Um, the reasons you might want to do that are, like I said, with uh, authentication or anything that's like hitting an API uh, that can be painful to deal with on CRAN. And so you can set that up on uh, GitHub without too much trouble. Uh, so you might want to do that. Um, you might have a vignette that like mentions or, or like makes use of a package that you don't want your package to depend on, but you want to use it as an example. Um, and they talk about, you can link to it in a special way in your um, your description for your package. And it what doesn't like require that CRAN, uh, like it doesn't stop you from deploying to CRAN. Normally, if you have something in imports, it has to be accessible from CRAN or Bioconductor or your package can't go to CRAN. Um, but if you want to just reference some package that's only on GitHub, for example, you could do that in your uh, in an article. Um, and if you have just a lot, of, a really big example, um, if you're, uh, uh, what's his, Tyler, um, Tyler Morgan Wall, I think is his name. He makes like 3D rendering packages for R. I'm guessing a lot of his things are only articles because uh, they're huge files. And uh, there are, we'll talk about this in a few chapters that CRAN has size limits. And if you're just trying to make a demo of a movie rendered, you don't want to take up your entire size limit with that one piece of one uh, article. And so that's what it, that's for. Um, and then the final thing that they talk a little bit about is um, you can have modes for your docs. So by default, um, when you build the docs, it, it builds it for whatever is on GitHub at the time, you know, like whatever that check-in involves. Um, but that can be uh, confusing, especially once you have your package on CRAN, if your docs get out of sync with the released version of the package. And so by default, you are using that release version. Um, that is a single site. It has everything that is in your current source of your package. They say that um, you could probably just stick with this, that in, until someone complains, <laughs> this is fine basically, because if you're not getting a ton of users, it's probably not a big deal. I would say, um, I don't know. I think once it's on CRAN, it's probably worth doing the switch because otherwise you're going to have people saying that I can't figure out how to make this thing work. It doesn't make any sense, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, um, it's because that documentation isn't for the version of the package that you're using. Uh, so it wouldn't make any sense. So um, the example that they have is, let me get rid of that one. This is the normal read our documentation. I don't know that this is going to look particularly different at the time that they wrote the book it did, uh, but we'll see a little bit of a change in a minute because there's also develop or yeah, develop mode, development mode that takes your um, website and makes a, a dev folder under the main docs folder. And that dev folder is basically a second copy of the website that is specifically for uh, like the current code versus the, it, the release would normally be just like the deployed or will be the deployed code in a second when we set it up. So we can see the example of that where it's got this uh, red in development version. Um, and let's see if I can move this out of the way. Um, it will have, uh, I don't think it, yeah, it's not showing. Yeah, read our development version. Um, there's no news there because I think they recently had a release. Uh, but there's, you know, you you can have your news for what is what you're working on right now, and you can have whatever reference. Like if you change something significant, it can be in the help, or even like even the the um, readme could be different. It could talk about what you're working on, things like that. And so, I had something that I did this for and I can't remember what it was now <laughs> but um you know I, I like the idea of it that once it's on CRAN you can set this up and then basically you can kind of freely talk about what you're working on without it breaking your website your main website so I, I like that idea and I also like 
knowing about this. Um, I, I have found that like, if I'm going to submit a fix for something in a package, uh, it's a good idea to go to the, their website and just switch to dev. And then you can kind of see what they have already done. You know, if it's, oh, this help doesn't make any sense. Let me fix it. Before you bother uh, cloning the repository or anything, you can just look at their help and go, oh, okay, they already fixed that help uh, in the dev version. That that works for pretty much anything that Posit makes. They tend to just automatically do this um, at least once it's on CRAN. Um, but not everyone will have this set up, of course. Uh, there is this auto flag that will automatically switch. Um, I'm pretty sure it's based on the version number. So if you have a dot nine thousand, it treats that as different than if you don't have the dot nine thousand. Um, it might also look use the releases in GitHub. All of that we will talk about in that last chapter when we're talking about Cran. Um, and then <laughs> it, it made me curious. Um, I think it was the notes. I don't think even, she even mentioned it in the book that it said something about there are um, mode fields such as release development and auto. And I was like, wait, what do you mean such as? Um, and I found that there's one more, it's unreleased. And what unreleased does is it basically puts the devel stuff into docs, but still shows the, the red in development version. Technically, I guess I could see Maybe I'll turn that on for my packages that I'm like working on um, so that people who are at least savvy to how these things work will know, oh, okay, this isn't a release package yet. That's all that's for. But um, yeah, so that was, that's the, ch the chapter. It's relatively short. Let me read uh, what I just said. So this is a bit of a tangent for if we have extra time, can you or we talk a little bit about debugging YAML? Yeah, I've been working on quarter site lately and I keep running into the problem that sometimes a change won't apply the way I think it should. It turns out to be because of a missing indent, but unlike with our code, there's no warning or error message and it's harder to understand how to start the debugging process. Seems like this could also be a difficulty with package down. Yes. So, oops. Um, I said back here, I, this... Looking at this, it doesn't look like it's indented right. I can't remember, but I, I would have thought that this line would be indented versus this. And so I don't know if I just didn't notice that while we were working on the notes. Oh, and like this this description almost certainly should be lined up with subtitle. Yeah, so like that's not indented right. So I, I need to go fix that. And that's a great example that I didn't notice it, uh, nothing broke until you try to actually use the YAML. Um, it's just one way, quiet. Yeah. Gives you no feedback. One thing that could work, I haven't gotten in, in the habit of doing this, but might be a way to deal with it is there's the YAML package. And if you kind of religiously use the YAML package for all your all your YAML editing, then like these would be um, at the same level of a list. And so it would automatically indent them right. Um, I don't know. So, and yeah, that would be the idea is you would have this um, list has subtitle equals rows, desk equals verbs that principally operate on rows, contents equals list, arrange, distinct. Um, and then it would deal with getting the indentation right. Other than that, like, it does seem like some places it will kind of flag, but it, it can't, like, the problem, the reason it doesn't flag it is all of these are valid YAML. They just mean different things, but it can't tell that you didn't mean it that way because <laughs> YAML yeah, is very sensitive, you know, it is sensitive to the indentation, but it uses it to have meaning. Um, so in theory, maybe using YAML, the YAML package to edit YAML would be a good way to do things. Um, and then you would just have to make sure you're thinking in uh, nested lists. 
um, it would it would probably at least be easier to see that you had a mistake. You would get you know issues with uh, missing closing parentheses or things like that. So maybe <laughs> I had um, I think it was yeah it's, it's the shiny Slack package. Um, you can like create your Slack app that you integrate the package with using YAML and you can like submit it to Slack and here's here's my um, client that I want to enable on Slack. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. There's this uh, YAML that you can just submit to, to Slack. I'll help the user make that YAML. I can use the YAML package. It's no big deal. Except, and I need to look back at this now that I understand YAML a little better, but it was having that problem. Like I couldn't get it to format it right. So I had to like, I think I ended up going through and um, building the YAML with the YAML package and then doing like a find and replace in the text to fix something because it wasn't formatting it right. And that's no good. Uh, it worked, but you know, it's messy. So a little bit of an answer, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, you I, validated how I was feeling, so that <laughs> also helps. And so I would say, like, just in general, like, the dash is telling us that we are at a level of a list. And I think, actually, I think that title and subtitle are at the same level, which is crazy to me. So you have to learn that. But, like, desk pretty certainly should be lined up, you know, it should be lined up with title or subtitle because it's what is a description of. And so you can kind of watch out for what goes together and that can at least help that the, the level of indentation, it's like lists and sublists and the indentation is what tells you that. You just have to know um, what it's using. And so that's where, this doesn't look right to me. So actually, let me, um, Oh, no, let's go to let me grab a window over there and get rid of this bar. Got to get some windows on the way um, and go to If I can get the, yeah. Okay. Oops. Um, okay. So this is what it should look like. So, so it wasn't totally wrong. The reference and title are at kind of the same level because the dash is telling us that we're inside of it. Um, let me get my chat back up in case anyone says anything. Um, and subtitle is at the same level as title, but desk is, you know, needs to be indented correctly. Um, and then things that are inside of the contents are like indented inside of the contents. Uh, there's one of those examples of starts with. Uh, I strongly suspect that um, me or the person before who worked on this changed the description from the normal one to this fancy one and lost the indentation when that happened. So uh, that's probably what's going on there. And um, so it has concept is what uh, uh, works with the family tags. And so you, if it has concept, whatever you called your family, that will uh, work. You can do keywords, you can do lax concepts. So that, could pen potentially work for the catch-all because I could put a, a concept in that is like documented or something. And then that would tell me the things that weren't documented, but at least keep them. I don't know. That might be something to play around with. Um, you can put things into your help from other packages, which is interesting. I don't, like if you re-export something, you could actually 
put it into your main help if you wanted to on your website. Um, anyway, I, I did like, there's so much you can do. You can put icons on all of the, the groups. Um, oh, the other one was, uh, so this, this has concept. This is going to do um, a family name that, you know, you might want to just have, you, you normally put that family in as something that's fairly code E but you might want something that's prettier to show up in your docs. And so you can have uh, in Roxygen 2, you can have a file that translates from the family, like the tag to a name to show up in the documentation. Um, there are all these things. I went digging a little bit today and between package down and the Roxygen 2 docs, there are all kinds of things you can do to make your documentation a little prettier. Um, I was playing with this, which need to set this up to be red um, and making these. And I did find just a little caveat. You can put links with the uh, markdown, but you can't put them at the beginning of the description that broke. Uh, so that was a fun thing to try to debug of why is this breaking? Oh, because links can't be at the beginning. Um, but this was setting it up to kind of automatically grab things, put them together. The next thing I need to do is go through and put some of these things into the same documentation, I think, because it's a little long right now, but for not really that many different functions. Um, this one doesn't have a logo even, so that's no fun. But this is my most complete right now. It's got to get started. It's got one article. Um, so, yes. Uh, anything else? We're good. <laughs> yeah, I do have, uh, these might, yeah, these need to change because technically they've got in, inaccurate, uh, URLs down on them, but these are magnets. Ooh, Tiny Tuesday magnets. Nice. <laughs> Are there, um, do people use anything besides GitHub or is that basically it? I I know um, some people use GitLab. Um, I have not, I have used way back when um, Bitbucket, the Atlassian, thing um github is just i don't know it's kind of the default for our packages and so it makes everything easier um if you don't have a really strong reason not to use it i recommend it but yeah i would be interested if anyone um like i know uh bob rudis all of his packages live on GitLab, but then they're mirrored to GitHub so people can find them wherever. Um, and technically, everything that's on CRAN is mirrored onto GitHub. There's a um, CRAN organization that just like copies the source of all CRAN packages um, so that you can, it, it's nice for searching. You can search through that org and find anything that's in any R package. Nice. All right. Well, if there is nothing else, I will see everybody on Slack. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. See y'all next week. Bye.